looks yeah. pretty much same throughout uh, and the control cabinet up up there, that's, that's where it goes. That's where everything goes everything. in. <coughs> All the controls goes in there. Uh, so oh, this is a nice, nice one. That's the exact same thing. Right, so here's what happened. All the suctions are tied into one header. Discharge ties into one header. Oil return one header. Oil <coughs> separator. What happened? The discharge is pumped through the oil separator. Yep. And the sieve is inside of that, right? Yeah. But that's one of the most common uh, internal construction. There are different construction. There are some with a, with, uh, a spiral that looks like an auger. Okay. Yeah, auger that auger that they, yeah. yeah, it has one of those. So when the oil hit it, the refrigerant, because it's light, it goes up and the oil goes the opposite way. It forms like a tornado. But, all right. It, in any case, they, they call them a coalescing oil separator. And that the oil starts as little, little droplets, and each of those droplets uh, get <coughs> to one another, form bigger droplets and gravity, and because it's heavy than the refrigerant paper, it goes to the bottom here. And it's going right. from the high pressure side and it's back to the low right. pressure, so it's... So, the so it the pressure, pressure differential would automatically put it here. You see this here? Yeah. It's a float. This is a float. Okay. With an oil level indicator here, just like that. Just like a toilet, like you said. Yes. <coughs> so when the pressure in here is low, this goes, goes down and open up and allow some of that oil to come in here. Okay. So there's no, there's no pump, there's no pump on this one. No, just pressure from the system <coughs> for that oil. And um, there always will be a vent for this. And that vent will be vented into the suction line. That discharge data? <coughs> yeah, you will. Straight up, where does where this? This here, this, this goes to the condenser. Uh -huh. Wherever that's located, this goes to your condenser because this is a refrigeration line. All right? And coming off of here, there will be a vent that comes like that and goes into the just in case you have a <coughs> high pressure situation. It's going to vent back there. You, you don't vent refrigerant into the atmosphere. So vent it back into the low, low, low pressure low side of the system. Right. And, and suction okay. filters. And these compressors all look the same, right? Well, what's, yeah. what's the key there? If there's a vent on that discharge line. It's not on the discharge, it's on this. It's on, oh, it's on that. Okay. Yeah. And it vents there. If you go back to chapter 26, you will see it on one of the diagrams. The receiver comes back from... You got this, the this goes to the condenser That's coil, here. right? That vapor comes back as liquid into the receiver. Okay. Goes through the liquid line filter dryer into my liquid header. Back in and that goes to all the evaporator metering device. Right, meter in device. Okay. right here, at this point, I will have my, if I need it, I will have my evaporator pressure regulators as well as my liquid line solenoid. And your Not here, sorry, up here. Right? Your metering device will be on top. Yes. My metering device will actually be right in the room, right next to the um, flow unit itself. Oh, we want yeah, the metering, inside. Yeah, we want a metering device right up to where the evaporator, to where the evaporator is. is. It must be an integral part of that evaporator. It's okay. coming off the... But it's coming off of this liquid yeah. header. <coughs> yeah. okay. So this is this liquid supply to all your rooms. So you're going to have seven then. You got yeah. seven uh, Yeah. And right up here, you will have the um, liquid line solenoid, or pump down solenoid if you want to call it that. See where the... See? <coughs> so, 
every compressor share the same oil, the same refrigerant. Oil level controls we just saw there. There is also um that's some kind of alarm. There is also oil level shutdown control in that system. We may have it. We may have actually oil level controls that shut the system down or that compressor down, or it may be an oil um, the oil pressure switch, which works on the pressure differential. And I did go through oil pressure switch, right? Yes. Yeah. Look like a nice clean piece of job, right? Yeah. <coughs> So, see how large this oil separator is? Mm -hmm. It has to take care of a lot of oil there. Put the vent, or is it? No, that's not, is that the one that has the vent coming off? Yeah, you're going to have a vent someplace in that. I think I see it. Okay. You mean at the behind it or something? It may be at the back. Yeah. Underneath the, the flag? Yeah, right Maybe somewhere the, around. Yeah, I think I see here it. Here but it will have a vent someplace. My oil level control. <coughs> no, you see that? Yeah. Typically, <coughs> when this compressor is running, that oil level should be the halfway mark. Right. So when this compressor is shut down, don't feel you may see the oil level riser right here. Don't think you you have too much oil. That's just because it's not it's running. It's like a car. Yeah. So again, EPR maintain a um, specific temperature by regulating suction. So, constant temperature, constant pressure. You don't want it better than this. But you know what happened, guys? Um, there is, there is um, one little problem with an EPR when we put it in a system that has a TXV as a metering device. When you guys were doing metering device, um, if you remember rightly, you were told that automatic expansion valve behave, behave contrary to what they're supposed to do. As you de as <coughs> there is the load is added to the box, that valve actually throttles refrigerant down and it starts the evaporator. Automatic. Automatic expansion valves. Yeah. Whereas the thermal expansion valve will yeah. open fully because the sensor superheat is higher than normal. It's going to try like hell to keep it. Right, it's going to try like hell to keep a constant superheat. So, automatic expansion valve is one of those backward valves. Don't bear in mind they work good at constant temperature system. So, now, if you have one of these systems with, with a EPR and you have a Thermal expansion valve as the metering device. That system will behave as a system that had an automatic expansion valve. Same behavior. Because it's not going to allow the system to go into a hot pull down. Right. All right. It's going to maintain constant pressure regardless. Mm -hmm. And now, when we go into hot pull down, that compressor pulls that evaporator side into as low pressure as possible to reduce that temperature as fast as possible. That ain't gonna allow me to do it. That little try thing. And it's gonna stay right there at whatever pressure it needs to maintain in that evaporator. And that's it. It's gonna say, you know what? Forget it. Do I do I not think that is what I'm supposed to do? Stubborn piece of thing. So, mm. It always System with that and a TXV always behave like if it has an automatic expansion valve. So the two systems, once that's present, they mimic each other in performance. So it's not gonna, like I said, 
It's not going to allow me to go into a hot pull down. These systems are designed to more or less hold, okay, and maintain a temperature, not to come from above and pull it down. Beer, mind you, it can do it. It's going to take like maybe three times as long as a regular system. Because if you had, yeah, had a bunch of food or something. Yeah, if it's above box temperature, yeah. The food will probably end up spoiling before the box oh, comes down to temperature. So you don't want it. Then. So you don't want it. You want it always pre chill to temperature and then load the boxes. Or freeze to temperature, then load the boxes. So that's why they bring in most of these supermarkets, they bring in refrigerated trucks. Right. So that they don't have to. Um, so the food is already cold. Yes. They don't have to experience all this load fluctuation. All right. So keep that in mind because. There will be a couple questions like that on your test on your final and right? Okay. So, notice I'm doing a review on everything now in order. Yeah. Rack system, electrical, so. <laughs> Guys, if you're writing this and I switch, let me know so I can stay here long enough that you write. If you can see the right up. <coughs> go back, go back, go back. Oh, is right mm -hmm. Yeah, always. Oh, the camera can see that. No. Does this song write to you guys, Valva? Does it sound kind of funny? Temperature and pressure result in changes of valve and compression. Well, yeah, but it's saying that you're going to get a change from the valve, whatever valve the dog is. Whatever valve. But how does it change the compressor operation? The compressor is still going to be. It's going to run at a higher. It's going to need a heavier load. It's going to be put on it, right? Yeah, but if I change the position of the suction valve, it means I can control the capacity of that compressor. Yeah, but it's there for capacity control. It's only I can I will only load the compressor with that which I need. So the compressor is only operating. From you unload it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's only, it's operating at a point to give me the, I'll match my output exactly. You don't want to run right? at 100%. It's not going to, it's not going to be running at 100% when I only need 23%. Um, uh, right? So if I had a six cylinder compressor. It will be running on two zones. It will be running on at 33 percent to give me uh, one third of the efficiency of that, uh, or the capacity, and at um, if I want full capacity, then I can release the valve and let the valve start operating, and it gives me the full <coughs> capacity. Because normally capacity con control is achieved by holding down the respective suction valves. So if I have the suction valves open, there's no compression in there. Right. That's the on unloader. That's what how the unloader works. So there, there are many different types of unloader. Some of them are controlled by um, solenoid, some by the pressure, the hydraulic pressure from the compressor operating, the oil pressure, and you can lift the um, open the valve with lifters, or you can have solenoids that close off certain sections of the um, manifold. This, this is exactly what you're going to see in one of these systems. Um, you know, even the smallest system, I was telling you guys about the beacon system. 
is a miniature of what this is. See, this is a standalone system that's independent of the walk-in box. With a beacon system, a scaled-down model of this controller is actually in the blower unit itself. With all the readouts, it's going to show you box temperature, operating temperature. <coughs> sure. to move back and forth yeah. to change something. Yeah, <coughs> and it, it's going to show you compressor runtime in the last 24 hours. It's going to tell you when it last went into a defrost, how long it's been in, in the defrost. You know, it's going to give you if there's a temperature spike, it's going to let you know that. Now you need a computer hookup to that? Yeah, well with this one, there's some idiot lights on the door. Oh, okay. That's but a there is a, there is a, um, you can hook up your laptop because there is a software program that goes with this system. It's and it's going to diagnose everything. It's going to tell you what happened here since day one that you started that but system. But that costs money, right? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. this software just to diagnose that is, I think the last price I checked was 3500 bucks. Yeah. yeah. And then you need the cable, right? And then you need the cable to go in there. Yeah. It's proprietary. And, uh, you know, everything is proprietary. Yeah. Yeah. Think nothing generic is going to work here. So, um, you know, and what I'll do so, uh, tomorrow, I'll bring in a um, miniature control because I showed you guys that electric expansion valve. Didn't I? How it move, open and close? No. No? No. Tomorrow I bring that and I bring the controller board for the beacon, beacon two systems. Okay. And I show you how it is a miniature of this. But it, they can be awesome, you know. See, um, these here, these are all either trans pressure transducers or the NTC or PTC. And these are all going to go right into your controller board. And that is going to, whatever input, that's going to sense it here. How do you know what this with? This is pressure. All right? No, yeah, but how do you know which, which one is the positive? There is um we uh we will not know which one is positive or negative. What they do, they have controllers that is these sensors that are specific to system. And this cable, this is a gray cable. If it's a specific manufacturer, they may have this manufactured with a yellow sheet in. Okay, meaning that's theirs. There's no way, um, the only way I can tell if it's an NTC or PTC is put the meat on it and check resistance as I vary <coughs> the temperature. Okay. And typically they, they will tell you um, that you can get it uh, in a glass with ice at 32 degrees and then check the resistance which should be about um, 30 ohms for an NTC, okay, and PTC it may be like 300 up to 1,000. So they will give you all the test values of them. You know, but every every one of these are kind of proprietary, manufacturer specific. There's nothing generic about these guys. So you can go and buy one that was made by his company and put it in a PC equipment that was made by his company. And um, this is a fill. This is a dryer. You notice they have one here, pressure transducer there, and they have one here. To tell, you, here. To, to tell you if it's getting a restriction or not. Yeah. Stop. If you see a pressure differential there, the system is going to tell you you need to change and uh, thing. And if it, if you guys have one of those newer style thermostat in your home, if you have central air. Occasionally on the lower right hand side or upper right hand side, if you didn't change your filter in, a, in about two months, it's a little nice little reminder comes up and says, dirty filter change. I'll let you finish it. I don't see my foundation. Check it out. They have it now. Because a lot of people go buy a torta day filter and, and leave, it, and in leave it in there for three months or six months. Or forever. Or forever. 
ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਹੈ ਗਾਈ ਇਨ ਦਿਸ ਸਕੂਲ ਦੇ ਦੈਟ ਇਨ ਸਾਲ ਇਸ ਸਿਸਟਮ ਐਨੀ ਦੀ ਡੇ ਆਈ ਕਵਰ ਥੋਟ ਹੀ ਡੇ ਫੇਲਡ ਦਾ ਹੀ ਵੈਂਟ ਹੋਮ ਐਂਡ ਚੈੱਕ ਹਿਸ ਬਿਕਾਜ਼ ਇਨ 3 ਇਅਰਸ ਇਨ ਸੀ ਪਰਟਾਈਜ਼ ਯਰ ਇਟ ਡਾਊਨ ਯੂ ਡੇ ਚੇਂਜ ਵੈਨ ਵੈਨ ਹੀ ਵੈਨ ਐਂਡ ਚੈੱਕ ਵਿਦ ਸਿਸਟਮ ਫੋਲੇ ਫਿਲਟਰ ਇਨ ਟੂ ਦੀ ਕੋਇਲਸ ਯਾ ਯਾ ਸੋ ਹੀ ਹੀ ਸਕ੍ਰੇਪ ਐਂਡ ਸਕ੍ਰੇਪ ਐਂਡ ਸਕ੍ਰੇਪ ਐਂਡ ਹੀ ਗਾਟ ਮੈਡ ਹੀ ਵੈਂਟ ਹੋਮ ਬਾਈ ਅਨ ਯਰ ਹੈਂਡਲ ਬਿਕਾਜ਼ ਹੀ ਕਨ ਗੈਟ ਦਾ ਫਿਲਟਰ ਆਊਟ ਫਰਮ ਦੀ ਕੋਇਲਸ ਯੂ ਨੋ That sounds familiar? Yes. Well, it's via head pressure regulator. Okay. <clears throat> In these systems, they are adjustable. Um, let me see if they have... Uh, adjustable and non-adjustable. <clears throat> yeah. See this here? Uh, this is the OR OA. The LAC looks the same thing like that too. All right. So OR OA LAC LAC4 LAC5 they all do the same thing and they all look <coughs> alike. Um This here comes with a pressure rated LAC 4-100 is for um 134A. LAC 5 or 4-180 is for R22 or 404 application. That's generic. When it comes to ice machines like Hosasaki's and Manitoba, they have these valves built to their specification and typically the head pressure on an R404 system would be LAC4 or LAC5-210 so as opposed to 180 because with a ice machine i need that e- extra high head pressure in order to harvest the ice off of the evaporator if the head pressure is too low it doesn't have the heat heat capacity to let the ice go off in the evaporator it needs to melt that ice off all right so the extra high head pressure at that point will allow me to harvest every single piece of ice off of the ice machine and this one this is adjustable this is a pressure differential valve that one is adjustable and guys you have to do this with your um, gauges on okay that's self adjusting it's set for one pressure and that's it and believe you me if i'm um, if you're new to this thing and you go out in the field don't feel bad if you see one of these and you suspect it's that get a second opinion this is one of the most difficult set of valves here to diagnose as bad Even the guys Paulan who made this they go nuts when it comes to diagnosing problem with those two because you never know for sure if it's this or that so typically we end up changing both of them and that's the one time I do not mind being a parts changer <laughs> because it's going to save me a lot of grief by changing both of them I want to you run into them Built. pretty often but doing when they work they work damn good they give you they give you a better control because you can adjust that and leave it there and if you run into problems because uh, somebody might have a um, imagine that system was outside and there were a couple of trees around and they had to cut down the tree or hurricane sandy blew it down then you had more prevailing winds coming in the more prevailing wind the colder this will get so the colder this get the more you have to adjust that to maintain a higher head pressure because prevailing, prevailing winds in the winter time can be a killer on these because it's going to make your head pressure go where it is supposed to go all right so if i have a automatic valve it's going to hold If I have this I have to adjust it to compensate. All right. So remember I covered some 
I'll show you guys something when we were doing the air dryers. I call it. When I show you the bypass valve to maintain the lower and the high side, and the low side. It's a differential control valve, same as this <laughs> system here. I can use this to do the same thing. Put an artificial load on my evaporator so it doesn't freeze up. But this one, like I said, if you suspect one of them is bad, and two things can happen. During the summer, you may find that this valve is not um, opening as it should. Head pressure will build up. Your compressor will cut out on high head pressure, always. All right, that's the one thing. It's gonna work in the winter, but during the summer, that's the one problem with them. They, they kind of get stuck in one position. Right. So if you check that and you find that's a problem, change this one too, because they work together. And if they were installed together, so if that goes, chances are this is gonna kind of be here for me. You have the system open, change it. They're cheap enough. <coughs> now, this is a um, this is another. Did I mention you summer did. winter? Yep. Yes. This is it. Um, Dual condenser where we had summer winter operation and, and uh, winter operation yeah. where we needed two condenser. And you shut one down. Yeah, one, well, it happens automatically. Oh, okay. All right? We really do not have to touch this, but the second, um, the second condenser there is a, like a partial receiver. It, 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 it takes the place of a receiver. Oh, okay. All right. And so in the summer we we have both being used because the air cools both. In the um, in the winter, we one is active, and the other one's holding and the, the other half, refrigerant. The other half of that thing is is holding the refrigerant. Is like. Just the same as when we flood a single unit to keep, to keep the pressure yeah, higher. Keep that's what happens. We flood one completely, and that's not being used in the winter. That's just there to provide um, less headroom for that other set of gases. Because whenever the whole idea is, guys, um, right, see this? No. If I have this here, And if I flood this lower half, the reason why refrigerant here, the pressure goes up, is because now I've cut the surface area, I've reduced the active surface area to cool this refrigerant gas by 50%. Right. This does not in any way contribute to cooling that there. So it actually builds an artificial pressure here and this goes up. Because, I, like I said, it's like, in effect, if you go out there and you take a piece of cardboard or something and you block your condenser unit 50%, that pressure will go up. Okay. That filling it with liquid refrigerant does the same thing. It has the same effect. We so did that. We did that with the, with the unit we built. You, you block the airflow? Yeah, we blocked. Yeah, that's, that's the same as blocking the airflow. But the thing is, it's there so that you have it when you want it, and when you don't want it, it goes back there. So you don't have to go there and add refrigerant and it's remove good refrigerant. Good idea. Uh, That's one, huh? Now, I did think we mentioned towers, right? And I did mention those over there. Yeah. And we have... Um, This tower is a condensing tower. And actually this doesn't have water going to it, it's air con air cool condenser. You notice it? Yes. Yeah, it has fans up here, no water. 
thing is, this sucks air from below. That's why it's raised. Up and out the top. Out the top. That's why it's raised. Even the smaller ones, they're about knee knee high from the floor, so that air goes in. Now, a lot of times, on the smaller system, not this, this you can walk on it and look up, but on the smaller systems that has just the fan and the coil, a lot of guys who go up there, you know, you have high head pressure, they go up there and they look down because they're standing up. They look down and the coil looks clean, right under the fan. But no, you have to go on and look up because it sucks <coughs> air in. Okay. And yeah, that's, that's where it's more often than not, that whole thing is blocked up with all that soot and dust and bugs and weed. And uh, actually bird feathers, pigeon feathers and pigeon crap. Uh, all of that is inside these units at, at times on the rooftop. What size pipe is that on there? That's that a big system, yeah, huh? Yeah, that looks like big. Um, this here? Yeah. That's huge system. That's about four inch. Yeah, that's four inch pipe. That's coming off the, the manifold. The, oh, that manifold right. there? Yeah. That like one the, would be um, the, the discharge from the compressor, right? Yeah. The, and this would be liquid going down to the <laughs> system. Now that's a big system. How much yeah. is that holding about? If I would, well, maybe about um, 20,000 pounds refrigerants. That, that little plant over there holds 22,000 pounds. Said that. Yeah. Did I ever show you the drawing on it? No. no. You should bring us over there. No, I can't take you guys over I know you told Security. <laughs> I'm just saying, you should anyway, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I can show you the drawing. No, you never showed us the drawing. <laughs> because they have, over there they have 1,100 horsepower water cooling. And the system has 22,000 pounds of R404 refrigerant. So, yeah. Good. I think um, somebody can explain that other than me. You pay to take over. I'll take over. You're in my class? Yeah, I'm here every day. Yeah, I'm like a sphere and this is the first time I've seen you. Yeah, right. <laughs> you must remember I'm an old guy, I lose my memory pretty fast. I, you know, I have a short term memory. Now, you know what it is? Because I'm not in the seat today. Anyhow. <laughs> so, this is a. Um, let me see the legend on this. Why do you have only two compressors? All right. Suction manifold, discharge manifold, oil separator. Um, yeah, yeah. Two of them, I'd say. Yes, and you see that CROT? It means closes and rise, rise of outdoor temperature. And the, right, because and as the temperature the rises, is, you want the gas to, to go through the... The other one is open on rise of indoor temperature? Yes, because it's on the suction. Uh, okay. And the S means it is on the suction, right? Yeah. So, two evaporators, liquid line, solenoid. Let me see what's... Um, Where's my condenser? Oh, up here. See how it yeah, went Summer and this summer winter. Summer <coughs> and summer winter. Yeah. So only one of those is active during the... What do they call that up there? A split condenser valve? Where? This? Yeah, yeah, number four. Yeah, I think... Let me move this. Yeah. It's a, um, so that's like a three-way valve. They can uh -huh. use one or both. Yeah. Right. So that allows you to use both of those there, or just one and of them. it does it automatically based on the 
the ambient temperature? Or? Yes, it does. Because you see here, yeah. see where that sensor is. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have too oh, much of that. a low temp, low pressure here. Yeah. They'll close that valve and go into a pump valve down. and raise the <clears throat> pressure in the, the high pressure side of it. So it's going to use some more of that gas from up there. Okay. So my liquid line solenoid valve is up here. Check valve because you got to bypass the liquid anyway. So, oil filter, oil reservoir. See here, has the oil film. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is um, just for illustration purposes. This is not a real life hookup. It's, it's really not gonna, um, the idea works in real life, not this diagram. So don't, never base a design on this diagram, right? Well, for one. And we see. Hot gas defrost evaporator. Um, and supermarket systems, what they do, when, whenever they use the hot gas to defrost one evaporator coil, you know, for that moment that the system is in defrost, it behaves, that coil <coughs> evaporator behaves like a condenser, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the hot gas in there condenses to liquid. Yeah. Now, it's going to be a waste of energy for me to pump that, direct that liquid into the suction accumulator, and then have the compressor try to vaporize that to unload the liquid. Yeah. But what if I took that mm -hmm. same liquid, which is in a subcool state, and inject it into the yeah. receiver where it's gonna go, where it's gonna go now on, into the liquid line and distribute to the rest of the room. It's already being cool and soft cool, yeah. right? Well, you so, said that, I think yeah, that's the whole idea with the um, thing. And this holds true. It's more efficient and faster than electric heaters anyway because this may take um, like five minutes, 10 minutes, while well, this may go into the half hour. Right, because that's heating the entire coil. Yeah, that's heating the entire coil. This is just heating the surface of the coil. Mm -hmm. Now, these are just, this diagram just um, illustrates different valves in different locations. You do not need all of these for this for the system to work. This is just where you will locate them. Okay? So this is not a working system. You put a system like this with all those valves, you're gonna run into a problem. At some time or the other you're gonna run into a problem. So if I think they have a diagram like this someplace outside. Sporling supermarket wiring diagram, it's in a blue background. And it's I didn't elaborate some place around. I know I've seen it. So just for illustration purposes again. So what will happen? When this defrost solenoid open to put this into defrost, if you notice, I'm now going to inject the hot gas <coughs> in the suction outlet. Yeah, it goes backwards. So this is going backwards. Yeah. And it goes this way, and right by the um, distributor, there's a tap with, with a check valve. This valve only allows flow that way. So anything that forms liquid in here goes here, and it goes back into the liquid line. So it goes, and then when it gets into the liquid line, goes into the liquid header, goes into the rest of the system that are active, for active cooling. When this switches over, this de-energizes, closes, refrigerant now, um, liquid line solenoid opens, Refrigerant comes here because this is now closed. It it's a one-way it go one way street. It, has it forces air through it. This goes back into cooling. Right, and right. it does a normal thing. 
kind of efficient, very, because you're going to get soft cool, actually soft cool liquid now going in and yeah. soft cool in that header with the liquid some more. And it's desuperheated. <coughs> yes, yeah, it's already been desuperheated, and here's the deal. Takes to the job. Yeah, we use all that desuperheated and all that energy that otherwise would have gone to waste. We just use it to defrost one while all the rest were working. And then we add we add sub cool into already sub cool refrigerant. Make it even more efficient when it hits your um bees. Evaporator coils. Oh. That's ice, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It does look like that in real life, anyway. You know. Expansion valve. See. This yeah, line is downstream of uh, my expansion valve. This is where the liquid comes in. The external equalizer. Yeah. Where's the uh, check valve? Is there a check valve on there? Oh, here. <coughs> this one here? That. That's it? That's a check valve. Okay. Looks simple, right? Yeah. Looks like a filter dryer. Looks like a um, Yeah, remember some time ago I told you guys it looks exactly like one of those copper style filter dryer. Right. But it does say... Um, check check. <coughs> and you can hear the ball <coughs> inside here. It'll have an arrow on it or something, right? Yeah. Yes, because it Direction. is sensitive to flow. Yeah. This one directional, yeah. so it will have the arrow. Um, whenever I buy these things and it has a paper there with the arrow, I take my mark and I put the direction because that paper drops off sometimes. And then you, you kind of lost. Okay, should I turn this this way or that way? Oh, you couldn't like yeah. test it, like blow yeah, through you it blow to through test it. it. But do you know what? I, 50-50, especially with filter dryers. Some filter dryers are um, bi-directional, some they're not, they're, they're direction sensitive. Right. So when the paper disappears, you're uh, out of that. Um, See, coming out right here, these are supposed to be my distributors, I should think. Yeah. It's some of those copper tubing that come off of that distributor. But well, when, I guess when the ice melts, we'll see, right? No, I didn't see. Well, it says that's when it's going into a hot gas deep. Yeah. It goes the other way. No, how much? How much sub cooling are you guys normally used to in a re in an air conditioning system? Twenty degrees. The high efficiency is twenty. The older one is thirty. Thirty degrees? No, no. no. That's sub cooling. Sub cooling is twenty degrees. Is it? Sub cooling. 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 Sub if I have that, what does it uh, means in terms of efficiency? Yeah, it's going up here. Yeah, more sub cooling. All right. But uh, always remember, guys, never try to sub cool uh, too close to ambient. You need a you need a few degrees because what happens? Let's say this room is seventy degrees. And I actually sub cool to 70 degrees out there, and I'm still sub cooling because some place in between that, that passageway, was at 68 degrees. Yeah. So now I sub cool to 68 degrees, and I come into this room with that sub cool liquid at 68 degrees. You're going to start. Yeah, I'm going to start boiling off that yeah. liquid there because the heat here it's higher. is yeah. higher. So it's going to start absorb heat, and that's what it behaves like an evaporator. That's what the evaporator so, does, yeah. absorb heat and boil. So it don't really make sense to so cool that Too low much. Ambient. Ambient. So, and the same thing as if you pass through an attic. Yeah. 
do not shop cool too much because when you go into that attic with a high 130 degrees heat, and believe you me guys, on a decent damn day, people's attic can get up to 130 degrees. I believe it. So I met you up there and you sweat so much of water that the, the sheet rock off of the ceiling collapsed. It never happened to me. What do you, mean you, what do you mean you believe it? You lived it. I did believe it. That's why I said I believe it. You lived it. Yeah, so I was telling you they're going to believe it. So 10 degrees of cooling is a norm for am. Um, and by the way, this 10 degrees is for refrigeration system. Uh, when we get into refrigeration system, so cooling, that we're looking for is way different from an air condition system, right? Uh -huh. The condenser split is different. The evaporator split and TDs are different. So the only thing you should try relate between the two is the principle behind the whole operation, uh, what the refrigerant does. Other than that, it's... Other than that, it's, like I said, you, you gotta think totally differently from here. Guys, I think it's break time. Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.